Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Be Freaking Awesome podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Sammy Kinnison, here with Angela Belford. And today we are joined by a very special guest from a place near and dear to our heart uh, in Toronto, Canada, all the way from Toronto. Um, Leah Davidson is here with us today. Thanks for joining us. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. When you so Oh, oh when you said that, I thought you were going to say she's from Instagram. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> really, yeah. I'm such a dork. Very special virtual place called Instagram. Oh, yes. Have you heard of it? <laughs> I forgot. I'm so glad you remember the Toronto. I didn't know that I would actually call Instagram a place that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Like, <laughs> me neither. It's phenomenal, but I don't know that that's Toronto, no. though. Toronto, Toronto is near and dear to my right. heart. Toronto yes. is near and dear. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, before we get going too much, Leah, will you just take a moment to introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do, and uh, then we'll get started with our fun conversations today. Absolutely. So I am a life coach, and I focus on nervous system resilience and stress and burnout. And I am also a speech language pathologist, and I've been doing that for mm, close to 25 years now. And um, really, that's where I started my love affair with the brain. And when most people think about speech pathology, they're thinking about people's R's and stuttering, which of course can be a piece of it. But I really um, have been working with people who have experienced traumatic brain injuries. And so working on their executive function skills, their cognitive communication skills, their nervous system. And so it was just a very natural um, progression that I found coaching. And I took a deep dive into mindset and how incredible that is and the power of our thoughts. And then I just realized there were other layers and it's the nervous system. So putting everything together that I've been learning the past uh, 25 years has brought me to this place here. And yes, I am in Toronto. I live here with my husband. We have a blended family of five kids and we are almost empty nesters. The last one is flying out in September. And so excited to just start a new chapter. Well, I'm sure Angela can tell you that empty nesting, I think you, uh, Angela, maybe I'll let you speak to it. You've recently told me though, something about like, you love this season of parenting, right? It, no. Oh, okay. My, <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, my favorite story about empty nesting is like, I went, my youngest daughter, uh, she said, Hey mom, my best friend is going on this cruise for spring break, my senior year. And I go, I love your friend, but I don't know if her parents' moral standards match mine in international waters. So I'll be tagging along with you. And mm -hmm. on that trip, and which is interesting because she and I didn't have a, we had a pretty rocky relationship, even at that time, I think it was almost a punishment that I was going, but <laughs> anyway, but she on that said, um, I don't know, something was said and she goes, oh, you're not even sad that I'm graduating in a few months. And I go, I'm not sad that you're graduating. And she was like, oh, cause she'd watch me be sad with Sammy. And then even a little bit with Josh. And I go, I have seen the other side. Right. I'm so excited to be your adult friend. Yeah. I'm so tired. To switch I'm, roles. Yeah. Oh just my take gosh. Step away from, yeah. Parenting for 25 freaking years. I'm yeah. tired. <laughs> and I know I'm looking forward to our, the next stage of our relationship. And she went, what? Yeah. And it was like mind blowing because she had been making that mean. I can tell, say now she had yeah. been making that mean that I didn't love her as much as the others. And I'm like, yeah. no, I just want to be your friend. It's so much more fun. So I yeah. love Dina's because yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Exactly. You get to see, um, it's so exciting to watch them bloom and to watch the adventures that they do and their choices that they make some good, some not so good, but to sit right. back and say, not my life. Um, <laughs> but then I, for them to see like you take on your own life and your own role. And I said to my husband not so long ago, I want to make sure we are creating a life that our kids are envious of. Yeah. And, and I just want them to see like, as you get older, you know, life continues, there's going to be amazing things, there's going to be challenging things. But as you get older, like it's not the end, it's it's a new chapter and it's an exciting chapter. So it I really, am just, I'm excited 
just to continue along. And now just completely having everyone gone, I really am like, let's dive in. What's going to (laughs) happen? Yeah, we, because of our day jobs, we're able to work remotely. And so a lot of my sweet darling friends, including my children are like, oh, it would be nice to spend five weeks in Costa Rica every year. And I'm like, well, it's not gonna be Costa Rica, but yes, we don't spend February anywhere cold. And I'm like, nobody envied my life at 26. I promise you when I had little kids. And so I am, I tell people all the time, I am your emptiness goal setting. I love that. So that is 100%. So I love that you say that about creating a life that your kids are like envious of and in the best way, in the most inspirational way to try and encourage them, like go on your journey, live your life, like do the things you need to do because it does keep getting better. Exactly. So anyway, I love that. Exactly. Oh my gosh. We could go I on and on about that. <laughs> I know this is not actually a podcast episode about empty nesting. Uh, this is just the moment where all of us get to realize that Angela and Leah are just the same person in different places. Perfect. I love that. <laughs> so, Thanks for having me. Message accomplished. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See, tune in next week. No, um, <laughs> Angela. What are we going to talk about today? Oh my goodness. Well, you know, we have been kind of working through the topics of the book and basically I am inviting sweet people that um, agree with the way I'm talking about these things in my book and inviting them on the podcast to kind of add more. I wanted to kind of add some depth to what we're talking about. And so we've been talking about the motivational triad and we're moving on to the nervous system. And so many people are all about the fight. I think it's pretty commonly known now, fight, flight, or freeze. That's not, that's not unknown to a lot of society, but what I think that, um, there is so much discussion around being triggered and such that, um, that I want to talk about that. And then also there's, there's a whole lot about like, Oh, like your thoughts, create your feelings. Mm -hmm, That's true. I'm not saying it's not true, but there it's deeper than that. And so Leah, I, today's episode is called befriend your nervous system. And, um, I want to share a quote that was on Insta on the Instagram from Leah. Um, and she, well, she quoted somebody else, but that's okay. Your brain thinks that things are fine, but if your nervous system feels otherwise, it wins, says Lauren and Andrew Hogue uh, mm-hmm. originally that quote, but you shared it. And so tell us more about that idea that your nervous system is running the show. We're going to debunk a little bit of positive thinking here. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I think I want to show that thinking is important. I, I never want to turn away from saying that I do believe mindset and all those things are powerful, but there is that behind the scenes story. And, and it's a big, but because, and it ties into what you were saying about being triggered too. Our nervous system is is running the behind the scenes of everything that we are doing. And our nervous system is the way that the body and the mind communicate with each other. And so that needs to be in alignment. And when it's not in alignment, then the nervous system wins. It takes over. The nervous system is there for our, um, you know, regulating everything, but it's also there for our survival. So it's constantly mm-hmm. scanning for safety and danger and safety and danger. And it's not real safety and danger. I mean, mm-hmm. that that would be great. We could, I think we all know things like that, but it's perceived safety and danger. And when the nervous system picks up on elements of danger, which could include anything from things that are unfamiliar, things that are similar to something that happened in the past, things that are completely unconscious and we're not even aware of, our nervous system picks up on that and it wants to protect us. And that's when it will get activated and go into that state of fight, flight, or freeze, as you mentioned, that's so common people talk about. 
as a way of protecting us. When we are in one of those states, there's fight, flight, and freeze. That's when we're in those activated states. Freeze is a little bit of a mixture between an activated and a, um, a down-regulated state. When we go into those states, one of the things that happens is our physiology changes. And our physiology sort of sets the stage of how we think and how we act and how we feel. So if you are in a, a state of activation and the sympathetic nervous system is activated and you're in fight, flight, or freeze, all your thoughts and your feelings and your actions are flavored that way. So you're going to be having, so if we take flight, for example, you're going to be having thoughts that are, you know, rushing and anxious and busy and maybe um, pressured and overwhelmed. Your feelings are going to likely um, have that same flavor of anxiety and scarcity and overwhelm. Your actions will be that you will have more energy. You want to move. You want to get, you know, um, you'll stay busy. You'll be ruminating. You'll be thinking about those things. So all these things are flavored by whatever state we're in the nervous system. So when we talk about how, oh, okay, our thinking, we get to choose it. I always say to people like, well, kind of, if we, if we know how to regulate our nervous system and we can acknowledge and befriend our nervous system and get it to feeling safe, and calm and regulated, then we have access to our thinking skills. And then our CEO can step in and say, yes, how do we want to think about this situation? But when we're not, when we are activated, our CEO is like, sorry, I'm out of here. Survival brain is in charge. You have no room for me. And so we can't be choosing what we're thinking and we're feeling when we're dysregulated. And that's why for me, everything has to start with regulation. When you're regulated and safe, you can choose your thoughts and you have access to all of them. And that doesn't mean just positive thoughts and positive right. feelings. You can choose to be, you know, upset or annoyed or frustrated. Your CEO is there and she can choose whatever she thinks is going to be best for that situation. But when you're dysregulated, she's like, sorry. We're in survival mode and survival mode doesn't care about your thinking and your language and all that's, it cares about keeping you alive. Wow. Like I have so many metaphors, like rolling through my brain. <laughs> I'm just, I'm thinking about like, I mean, maybe because I've done a lot of event management over the years and I've done, had to do work with different, like first responder situations, mm. like you can have the best laid plans, but if the fire marshal comes in and says, uh, uh, like That's your right. plan is going to be put on hold, yes, right? Because exactly. the fire marshal has said, this is yeah. not a safe environment. And, and you don't, it doesn't matter which time frame is, That's doesn't right. matter what your schedule is. If the fire marshal, the police chief walks in and says, they nope, will win, they will they shut win. it all down. And yeah. so, and I also love the clarity of saying a regulated nervous system can choose their thoughts. Absolutely. Because I have been trying to say that. And I always spend so many words trying to be like, yes, but if you have all of this, you know, underlying stuff that you have this unresolved trauma and trauma is something your brain yeah. can't make sense of. It's not necessarily capital T trauma, like yeah. all these things, then you may be in this activated state, which doesn't, which actually, I love the word flavored man. Oh man. Yeah. So much, so many good yeah. things. Yeah. And that's why I don't, I, I love, you know, I've seen a lot of people, they, they, there's a lot of talk about like, Oh, you know, mindset work doesn't matter. It's all body work. I'm like, it's, Together, you know, yes. the, our nervous system, that parasympathetic system, which is responsible for getting us to rest and digest and safety, it's bi-directional and it has, um, you know, it's a connection of fibers that is communicating back and forth between the body and the brain. Well, 20% of the messages come from the brain down to the body and 80% of the fibers come from body up to the brain which means that we probably are going to have a lot more success if we start in the body, regulating our nervous system, taking care of our physiology. And when we take care of our physiology, our psychology will follow. Now it does hold true that our psychology influences as our physiology, but it's only 20%. So we actually want to have both. 
Yes. We want to have both because when yes. we are regulated, it does allow us access to our CEO, all our executive function skills. And that's where my, my speech pathology background comes in because that's all I've worked with is executive function skills and the importance of them. You need to have your CEO online. You want to have your CEO in charge, but you got to figure out how to access her. And when you're dysregulated, she's out. She's, she's not accessible. And, and so we can access her and then she steps in and she can come up with the best intentional models and she can help you create mm -hmm. the results that you want, but she can't do it when you're dysregulated. I love that so much in so much, so many ways I had, you know, my first book was called um, developing a success or subtitled. It was called be freaking awesome, but developing a success mindset. And so I fought everyone on the planet that helped me with my second book, because I said, it's a prequel. And they were like, it's not a prequel. They were like, it's so much more advanced. The conversation is so much more advanced. You can't, it's not a prequel. It's not. And I was like, it is a prequel because yeah. you can't make all of those active choices. This is, this is like what I've been trying to say. It's like, you got to get the order of operation, you know, right. in, in math, a math equation, you're going to get yeah. the answer where wrong. you put those brackets matters, where you put the brackets <laughs> and whether or not you do that, you have to do what's inside the parentheses yeah, first. first. And the nervous system is inside. Is, that's, that's right. That's, that's <laughs> the great analogy. The nervous system is inside. You've got to take care of it first. Everything else will impact it as well, but you've got to do the brackets. Yeah. Oh my gosh. One of my, um, probably the person that has read the most versions of my book, she's sort of kind of adopted me as a mom here the last couple of years. Anyway, she's a math teacher. She's going to love that. I finally put my stuff. Bed mass. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. Bed mass. What is it? Brackets, exponents and something. Like yes. That. <laughs> I think I was like the uh, American one that I've heard is PEMDAS and it's. Oh, okay. Sorry. Maybe it's yeah, Canadian. instead of brackets, parentheses, <laughs> like that's so funny to me, though. I was like, it's the same thing, but it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You'll, yeah. you'll hear some Canadianism slip out of me, especially that's if okay. we're going to talk about the process of things. Yes, <laughs> yes, we have process. Yes. So we funny. Do. We do. Well, um, and. Uh, sorry, yesterday somebody was saying, oh, Canada, we were talking about my speaking and willingness to travel. And yeah. they said, well, Canada is practically home for you because you're practically Canadian. I'm like, I am feel like it. I've been married yeah. into the family for 30 years. Oh, so yeah. I love you to inject some A's in your. <laughs> oh, get me in Toronto. And I promise you, do you get it? Because <laughs> I like pick up accents. And... I know. I love, anyway, it. I love it. So sorry, Sammy, go ahead. So for me, something about this, this conversation that's really encouraging is that there are times where like I have been in situations where maybe I'm not feeling like I'm enough or I, there's something deep going on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like the messages and encouragement is just like, well, just think differently. Mm -hmm. And then I try to think differently and then I don't, and then I get discouraged because and so then that, that loop of like, whenever I am not able to just change my thought when something else derails that for a while, that then was like, well, golly, here's even more evidence that you're not enough. And here's right. even more evidence that you can't do this. And that all of these things, it's been so interesting on this journey of really addressing my inner self, my nervous system, releasing past traumas. Mm -hmm. And even like Angela and I talk about trauma is not always big capital T trauma, but things that you can't make sense of. And yeah. then now, like this week, I had a situation where a, a, a previous version of Sammy would have really been stuck in the golly, this means something about me. I keep saying golly, um, <laughs> my word of the day, apparently. <laughs> uh, this would have meant something about me. And, and it would have probably meant that I'm not enough mm -hmm. now it doesn't mean something about me. And I'm in this weird spot where I'm like, this is annoying. Mm -hmm. Okay. But like, it doesn't have to mean anything. It's just as well. Yeah. Those, yeah. It was a, I remembered what it was. Uh, it was a client who was yelling at me about something that was not actually my fault. And I'm pretty sure that they were mad that they dropped the ball. So they yelled at me for it. Yeah. And I'm like, I, this doesn't, I'm not like, I actually don't, regret my actions. I have done everything that I could to the best of my ability. Right. 
I'm not like pleased that somebody's yelling at me. I like when I face life situations, the goal of this is not to get to a point where, you know, like everything is just completely neutral and I receive right. everything in this glowing, you know, beautiful, oh, I just receive it and let it go. It's like, no, this was annoying that somebody yeah. called to yell at me. Yeah. Yeah. And then I like moved on and it did yeah. not have a, this huge, big impact on me. Anyway, it's been a weird phase that I have been yeah. in my life where somebody can yell at me and I just like, well, okay, that was interesting. But I, it doesn't well, I mean think, something about me. I think that um, a healthy nervous system is one that can respond appropriately to whatever is being thrown at it, right? So you're right. Our goal is not to to be neutral. Our goal is to be able to sort of move up and down free up and down freely. So in that situation, when somebody is yelling at you and your nervous system is basically going safety, danger, safety, danger, well, somebody yelling at you is danger. And so it has a couple of choices. If it is in danger, it's going to be activated. Now, if it feels really, really threatened, it may even just shut down. And mm -hmm. when we shut down, what happens is all the flavor is a flavor of shutdown. And that's where we may start to feel things like I'm not enough. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. Why is this happening to me? We may feel sad. We may sit, feel low. So all the, our nervous system is creating that lens from which we view everything. So when you have the thought of something like I'm not enough, I always encourage my clients to just stop and ask, okay, where does I'm not enough? What flavor, what lens would that fall under? Okay, that would probably fall under more of a shutdown. Okay, so that was your biological response to something that was triggered as danger. Not a weakness of yours, not a moral failing, not even truth. It's just your biological response. And this is how your survival, your survival brain is acting and how it's trying to protect you. And when you can start seeing things as that, you know, biological, physiological response, I think it removes so much of the shame and so much of the like, why did I do that? Why didn't I say this? Why didn't I say that? Well, I did because this is how my nervous system responded. And my nervous system has been shaped it's been imprinted millions of times since I was in utero. Every single, when you said, you know, trauma is not just big T. Trauma can occur at any stage, tiniest little, we've all experienced trauma. And trauma just means that we have been stuck in a dysregulated state. We're not able to return to our home base. We don't know how to get home. We haven't had safety. And that's what we just need to start working on. Oh, isn't it interesting that I reacted that way, that that is how my nervous system responded. What do I need to do to feel safer in myself? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do to befriend my nervous system and get myself up to a place where now I can start thinking and choosing, yeah, I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to take that. Here's how I'm going to respond. I love it too, because a lot of times when I work with people, they're like, they're very reluctant to let go of some of these negative beliefs they have. They're very reluctant to let go of their inner critic. They're just so yeah. sure they will not be as good at their job if they don't have their inner critic yelling at them and cracking the whip. And what I love is that number one, Sammy, what you've demonstrated, because you actually had two situations because since I'm also boss and sometimes I get the mom call and sometimes I get the boss call. Yeah. Um, I got the call two different times and, and she was like, this was annoying. Two different clients in the same week. And we've recently like done a lot of work on, on clearing out a lot of those beliefs for her. Um, and so she was like, it was almost a natural feeling to her, but she still felt something. I felt annoyed that they were yelling at me. I can see she is now able to see their nervous system. Right. And see that they're in dysregulation and, right. and leave it in their space. This is not, mm -hmm. this is not mine to take on. This is theirs. That's, That's right. fine. And she also though checked in, which is, this is the part that I think is the maturity piece of it is that she did check in and she goes, okay, I did this. I did this. I did this. I probably, I sent them four emails. I could have texted them. Okay. Maybe they're a little accustomed to us babying them a little bit. Okay, fine. I can do that better in the future. And then it just like, like it didn't wreck her day. 
you know, and then she got to jump right back into work. And so when people are like, no, 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 my inner critic helps me. But if it hijacks for the next three or four hours, how yeah. is that helpful? And then yeah. now, like you start interacting with everybody else and the ick becomes ick becomes ick becomes ick. And now a bunch of people around you are also in activated states. And that is not that is not a recipe for productivity. Right. <laughs> and I do think that what happens is a lot of people have been stuck. A lot of people have experienced yes. trauma and they get stuck in that dysregulated place of protection and that sympathetic energy. And what, what happens is they don't really know what safety feels like. They only know what it's like to live in that energetic space. And they start to associate that energy with productivity and that busyness and uh, everything. Well, this is how I get things done. What they don't realize is imagine how much you would get done if you actually invited safety into the equation. Yes. They're really stuck in dysregulation. I think a lot of my clients, especially overachievers, people who have a lot of perfectionist tendencies, they will, when I'm working with them, they'll have this realization where I talk about, you know, different zones. We want to get in our safety zone. I call it the zone of resilience. And they're like, I don't think I've ever been there. I think I just have lived in that hyper aroused yes. state. I call it team hyper. I think I'm just constantly have been on team hyper. And I was like, yeah, you're not alone. A lot of us have been. And, and it is partly to do with different situations throughout our life where we've experienced trauma and it's never been processed and we are stuck. Yep. We've adapted. We've over adapted. We've learned how to compensate. We've learned to invite things like the inner critic. And sometimes it works. It does. It's it works until eventually what happens is chronic pain, chronic illness, anxiety, relationship challenges, and our world starts to fall apart. And we think like, I just need to work harder to save it. And actually what it is, is no, you need to understand your nervous system has been trying to communicate with you. And eventually it's going to hit the point where it's like, I'm sorry, I'm shutting you down. You are going to have to take care of this because of this illness or this challenge. And you have to stop and reset and look at it. I have said often that the, it often, de, hmm, there's so much in my brain right now, but it doesn't always look different from the outside, right. but it feels different on the inside. So like, I actually went to dinner recently with a friend of mine that known me for 25 years. And she goes, Angela, you've always talked about this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but what I went on a journey three years ago is that on the outside, I looked successful and now I also feel successful yeah. yes. to go with yeah. it. And now there's not the inner critic is not, do I not get, oh my goodness. Yes. To have the whole, you know, you write a book, <laughs> even after sure. you're done with lots of coaching, like I promise you plenty of opportunity to practice what I preach, but that's what's it's it's been hard for me to actually explain to people and like you know so much of when we talk about marketing it's like well market the results <laughs> and it's like well it may not look different on the outside yeah. but yeah. it feels so different it fuels it. it yeah yes and then also it's hard to explain the <laughs> conservation of energy mm -hmm. like how you're just not as tired right and rest actually works right you know yeah. and i've also come to appreciate that like no i actually need rest i had yeah. yesterday somebody say that i was um a talkative ex a talkative introvert and i about blew i'm like okay you just blew my mind a little bit and then she's like let's look at all the time that you have to spend yeah. at home alone quiet yeah. but i also back to people not feeling in that team hyper versus regulated. I think that eventually at some point in our journey, many of us like stopped feeling what was in our body because it was just too scary. And we just totally abandoned ourselves. Well, we go into conservation mode. Like after yeah. we've been up in that activated state for a while, we're running, running, running. And sometimes what happens is our body just says to us, listen, we have been trying to deal with this by being activated running. We're running out of steam. So we're going to conserve energy and we drop down into a shutdown mode. And that's where burnout lives, right? Burnout is a nervous system dysregulation challenge. It's not a problem of doing too many things. 
you can have a lot of things, which requires a lot of energy, but essentially burnout is just, you have been pushing it for too long without refueling. You have been dysregulated for too long that the body just says we have to shut down in order to survive. And we will go down into that collapse mode. A lot of times then people will, that's dissociation, that's numbing. That's where people feel like, you know, they're in victim mode because this is conservation. And, and uh, yeah, I think that's what we do to, to take care of ourselves. So one of the things that I am hearing both of you say, I want to say it in like the really blunt way. So we can just, you know, cut to the point. (laughs) It can suck to go through this process. Like we are not necessarily inviting people into like this warm, fuzzy (laughs) feeling fireside chat. It's like, no, it's actually inviting people to like, go wade into what can feel like just the muckiest gross part of you. We want to, we're trying to get help people establish safety Mm -hmm. in their bodies, in their environments. Well, actually it has to start. You you need a safe environment. So safe environment, safety in their body, safety in their relationship. But when people have been dysregulated for so long, they don't even know what safety is. So then what happens is safety can start to feel very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to move very slowly. The nervous system is not just going to change overnight. If you have been in a state of dysregulation and, and Angela, you probably have experienced this when you're working with very high achieving people of a lot of perfectionistic tendencies and you invite them to befriend their nervous system by doing things like resting, that does not feel safe to them. No, That feels like uh, that's probably the worst idea you could offer to me because their nervous system is not used to it. So it does feel not great to put it mildly. You will go through these ups and downs. And it it sounds sort of ironic when you are inviting safety into your life for a lot of people that can be really, really challenging. And it's easier to stay activated and dysregulated. And then what happens is, is sometimes we do, like I said, encounter that chronic pain, those chronic illnesses, those challenges in relationships that essentially force us to take care of ourselves. And that's not easy either. Right. Because then we're forced to do something that it makes me think my, when I first sort of started this journey, um, I started working with a therapist, um, to get, uh, I was like a little bit vulnerable. I think I've shared before after I had my first son, it was about when he was 18 months old is when I admitted out loud for the first time that I'd been suicidal for about six months and actually started to get help to find that, get some more regulation within that. And my therapist that I started working with was like, have you thought about going on a walk? And I remember just being like, this is the dumbest thing that I've ever been told. I told you I'm dealing with this big giant problem and you're telling me to go on like, I think on, on Instagram, our beloved friend, uh, yeah. people joke about the the stupid walk for my stupid mental health kind of thing. And yeah. at the time I was like, I'm going on walks. I don't know what you're looking for. Like, okay, whatever. I'm going to start doing this every day. Now reflecting back, there is something about when I have all of this pent up energy and pent up things in my body that I don't know what to do with. Right. Going on a walk actually is like a really small baby step to yeah. start to practice, to let things go, to feel some mm-hmm. things, to move your body in a way when I'm just mm-hmm. sitting still at my house in the middle of the pandemic, not doing anything, go for a walk and let it go. I can now look back and I definitely understand where she was going with is that like, I can't tell you, let's go dive deep into all of this really hard stuff on day one. Like we really do need to baby step it there. Um, But I I just feel very annoyed. (laughs) That's why movement is so powerful because when we are activated, when we, we are struggling with a lot of energy. So maybe we're feeling, you know, anxious or angry or on edge movement allows us to release that energy and we can get Mm -hmm. that energy out. The same is also true when we're in shutdown, when we are in shutdown, we actually need to be adding energy to our system to help us upregulate, to help us come out. And for many people like, and, and for yourself who really are 
very, very low, it may be too much even to go for a walk. And so the idea is what movement can you stand up? Can you move across the room? Can you imagine going for a walk? We do know that movement, once you get going, it can help bring that energy and help upregulate. That's why it's such a powerful, and I think why we need to be doing it every single day, because it doesn't matter where you are within your nervous system, movement is going to help. It's either going to help you downregulate or it's going to help you upregulate. And it needs to be done daily because we need to be resetting those stress cycles that we're feeling on an ongoing basis. But it can be very challenging for people, especially who are really, really low, um, that they may need somebody to say, come for a walk with me. And -hmm. we're just going to the bottom of the driveway. Yeah. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly is something that me and my perfectionist uh, journey have had to latch onto. And so even if it's worth taking a walk, take a short walk, take a bad walk. That's better than taking no walk. Like, I don't know what a bad walk actually is, but sometimes it was that reassurance of like, do it poorly. Cause that's yeah. still okay. Exactly. So exactly. I've even heard about like the, like I talk about Feldenkrais, which is a, a method of moving your body. Mm-hmm. And even just, if you can't stand up, like, can you touch your toe? Can you move your toes? Yeah. Can you feel your feet on the ground? Yeah. Like, yeah. And can you, because we have such low energy, like even, um, can you put like pressure a little bit, even just like pushing your hands, yep. you know, touching a wall, we're just trying to build up some energy. Yes. That's what it's all about. And that's when somebody is in really a shutdown state, which a lot of people who suffer from depression and certainly if they have suicidal ideation that, they likely are going to be very low. And so it's not helpful if somebody says, have you joined a gym? Have you, that can work when, when people are, have a certain level of wellness that they're able to, to do. But when we are, are talking, when somebody's, you know, so, so, so low, it is things like, let's start with just any kind of movement, your fingers, your toes, some pressure, you know, rubbing your legs a little bit, doing some of that havening technique, just things like that. Starting to feel the touch and getting mm-hmm. a little bit of energy in the body. We're, we're going to start with slow movements like that. And that's okay. That's good. Mm-hmm. That's we're we're increasing so energy. My my question to kind of start us to in our final <laughs> descent of landing the plane, <laughs> um, which I think was already we're talking about this a little bit. What are things that people can do to befriend their nervous system? Mm-hmm. I think that was a really good example of like if it's so big and so hard, you can start really small, and that still matters. Like you can right. start with feeling just little sensations. Um, if we were to move past that and some other ideas, what are other ways that we can befriend our nervous system? So movement for sure is one, any kind of movement doesn't have to just be walking. It could be dancing. It just could be stretching. It could be, that's why things like yoga and all those things are powerful. I'd say the next place to go to is with breathing and different kinds of breath work. Again, there's breath work that can help you downregulate and there's breath work that can help you upregulate. Um, breathing is the one thing that is can be not voluntary and voluntary. So we can turn to our breath and our breath is in our body. And when we drop into our body, we come into the present. Our minds can go to the past and the future and the present, but our body is always in the present. So it's mm-hmm. it serves as an anchor. So the breath is an excellent anchor because you always have it with you. And we can use it, say, if we have a lot of anxiety or a lot of energy, our focus is going to be on the exhalation. So we can do, and there's so many different techniques. I like the physiological sigh, which is where you sort of take two quicker breaths in and then a much longer exhalation, but there's lots of different techniques, but the focus is on exhalation. When you are really in that low state, that can help too, just very basic, but sometimes it's just focusing on what does breathing feel like in my body? 
And so you're not worrying about, you know, counting out the breaths. You're just noticing, does this feel good? And then for some people, they actually like to push their breathing. And so they'll want it to be a little bit more activated. And you can see that, like I always picture, I used to do a ton of driving when I was on the road as a speech pathologist and I would get so tired. And so I would do like some quick breaths, you know, that like where I just was trying to get myself activated, add energy to my system. So you can do that. And then, I mean, there's things like meditation, creative expression. There's lots of ways to regulate our nervous system. We just need to be doing things consistently, itty bitty things consistently every single day to help our nervous system start to get familiar to what it feels like to be inviting in movement and creative expression and um, breathing. And then of course, it's very helpful if we have somebody who's in tune with us and they can co-regulate with us. Sometimes if you're struggling to do things on your own, find somebody that you trust that is a safe person to with you and do it with them. And that can be so powerful as co-regulation is how we learn to self-regulate. So it can be so, par- be so powerful to pair up with somebody else. I got to experience this, experience this, this week with my 14 month old, actually, we are doing swim lessons. He hates it. He hates every minute of it. He just cries and cries and cries. Um, and we'll hit a point where like, he is crying so much that like, we can't, kind of move forward. Right. And so one of the things that I've started doing with him is I'll sit with him at the edge of the pool and I put one hand on his chest and one hand on his back and I mm-hmm. breathe with him That's and right. I do this like in like expanding and sort of help lift him up and then this kind of contracting and kind of shrink him down and it has been it was really beautiful to watch how me breathing with him and sort of showing even like a a baby showing yeah. him how we take deep yeah. breaths, even though, you know, it doesn't really start with him breathing with me, sort of that like yeah. lifting and, and pulling and all of that helps him to calm down mm-hmm. to breathe a little more. And I, even though I know he doesn't understand everything, like I'll repeat to him several times, you're safe. I'm not going to let you drop. Right. I am here with you. You're not alone. Yeah. It's been really neat to co-regulate with that's my right. And you're building the nervous old. system. You're building the nervous system with him. I mean, children are that's how they learn about their nervous system. That's how they learn to regulate through co-regulation. And if they can have an adult in their life that co-regulates with them, it's amazing. They're set. Yeah. It yeah. really you're setting him up for having healthy self-regulation down the road, too. Yeah. Okay. Angela, did you have something to add? Oh, it was so seven thoughts ago. This is just uh, (laughs) fantastic. I, I was like, Ooh, I love that. And sometimes our imagination, I would say, I just want to like cue in on that as an opportunity, um, to regulate yourself because you can literally sit here. And if you close your eyes and you imagine that you're getting like on your favorite roller coaster and you drive yourself through that whole roller coaster experience, maybe it's not a roller coaster for you, but it's a favorite drive that you have your body. Even if you're just visualizing your mind will follow and it will get all excited just like that being on that roller coaster. And so I would say another tool that you can use to regulate is to imagine yourself. And I share that in my, when I was pregnant and having Sammy, the Lamaze instructor was like, we're going to go to our happy place, Mm -hmm. you know? And so she like led us through this guided visualization. And this was Mm -hmm. almost 30 years ago now, but it would to help us, you know, know how to go into a place. So even if your environment isn't safe, yeah begin to build the imaginary place. And I know that sometimes people look at me like I just have three heads because when you have abandoned yourself and you're not willing to be in your body, being in your imagination can feel extremely unsettling, unsafe, all of those things. So all of these tools, oh, all of these tools, use them as needed. I know what I was going to say, which was consistency. 
So as a recovering perfectionist, when you say use these consistently, do these every day, I instantly like felt it in my body Mm -hmm. and want to assure people, even if you do it inconsistently, do it when you notice you will over time, you will start to see the benefits of it where you just start something simple. And if one day you go for a walk and the next day you don't go for a walk, don't beat yourself up. The next time you think about going for a walk, go for a walk. And, and yes, we can use all of the things that, you know, James Clear teaches us in atomic habits. And those are beautiful and amazing, but I just want to caution it's okay if you do it inconsistently too. Right. Like it's okay if one day you're breathing, the next day you're taking a walk and the next day you're having a dance party and the next day, you know what I mean? Like the thing yeah. you want and to do so, is heighten your awareness totally. to your nervous system. I was going to say, I'm glad you brought that up because, and especially because you, your nervous system told you that was dangerous, that, that. And when I think of consistency, I, I really think of like, Within my toolbox of taking care of my nervous system, there's probably about 50 different things. Right. And I want to consistently draw on that box. Yes. And sometimes that means I'm walking. Sometimes that means I'm lying on the couch. Sometimes that means I'm having a big old piece of cake. And sometimes that means I am, you know, talking to a friend, doing creative. And, and the goal for me, consistency is consistently taking care of yes. what it is that I need, not yes. just abandoning myself and walking away, but I do want to consistently make sure that I'm a priority. I don't know what that's going to look like. Yep. And sometimes it may look like three weeks in a row, I'm having a really great morning routine, yes. but I do know that I will consistently have my own back and be befriending my nervous system. Yeah. Great word. I yeah. love this. Any like final thoughts to leave people with final encouragements. I think really, you know, start where you're at. I love that. Um, you know, you brought up imagination. One of the first things that I do with my clients is we, we create that imaginary safe space so that you always have that with you. And sometimes it's imaginary. Sometimes it's a memory. Sometimes it's an area in your body. Our goal is to feel safer with ourselves And safety is connection and safety is healing. And when we look at all the different layers that we have, all the traumas that we have experienced, all the relationship challenges that we have, the anchor is always going to be in safety. And just finding what works for you where you feel safe And often it's through like a breath or it may be through imagination, meditation. I have them cue it into a certain body part so that they, every time they, you know, even just putting your hand on your heart sends that Mm -hmm. message of safety. I think that's kind of what we want to be aiming for. How can I ensure that I feel safe? Because when I can feel safe, I can allow my body to relax. And then that sends a message up that I'm safe because my body's relaxed and then I've created a whole new pathway. It's a pathway of regulation. And when we are regulated, then we've got a lot of power to do so many things in this world. I think that's wonderful. Love it so much. And I am excited that we are no longer talking about my book will soon be out. You guys can go get the book because we talk about a lot of these things. So thank you, Leah, for coming on as we are You're expanding welcome. all of this. This is super great. I love your just terminology and you guys should definitely follow her on the Insta and we'll put that in the show notes and also i on your website you have a very cool video 30 seconds to regulating your nervous system Mm -hmm. and if people are struggling with burnout then leah is a great resource for that so thank you thank you for your generosity of time today thank you where can people find you you said instagram but if people Yep. are just listening, aren't going to read the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm at Leah Davidson Life Coaching, Instagram, Facebook, and I have a podcast called Building Resilience. Oh, yeah. I love it. 
thanks everybody for joining us today. And I hope that you guys are able to take something from this, go regulate and befriend your nervous system a little bit more. And for now, I hope you guys go be freaking awesome. Mm -hmm.